Welcome everybody to the new Liar podcast. We're back again with a new and very interesting guest, Miss Cynthia Chung. Welcome, Cynthia. Thank you for having me. So Cynthia is a, the director of the Rising Tide Foundation, which is a foundation dedicated to promoting an intercultural uh, dialogue, dialogue among, cult- among cultures, a promotion of the high arts, science, and just everything having to do with uh, developing a more uh, creative, uh, a more creative society in, in, in a sense, right, Cynthia? Uh, yeah, to ger- uh, generate, I think, creative um, ideas towards uh, solutions to today's problems. Right. And you, you guys talk a lot about uh, different political problems, geopolitical questions, uh, cultural questions, societal questions. You're also a journalist with strategic culture, among several other outlets where you write about intelligence matters, history, uh, geopolitical matters. So you're, you're a very interesting individual. And like myself, you also have a great appreciation and love for Shakespeare and all things Shakespearean. And Schiller, Friedrich Schiller, the great German poet. And we're going to be talking about that. And I think, especially today, and we we should make a disclaimer here, you know, this isn't the political podcast, but there are certain themes that if we look at the greatest works of Shakespeare, if we look at the greatest works of Schiller, uh, and a lot of the great uh, tragedians, right, this question of world history of world historical individuals, individuals who have insight or a lack of insight into the higher processes shaping the world that presents themselves to their immediate perceptions. This is a very, I mean, this is a very profound theme. And I think especially today, uh, it's interesting. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot, a lot of discussion or a lot of light is, uh, put on the question of the role of intelligence agencies in shaping certain political processes and also of uh, what I think, I mean, people call it the culture wars, right? Or ideological warfare. There's all sorts of different takes on that. But I think the point that we're really going to get at today is that all these questions of intelligence warfare, ideological warfare, this isn't new. People like Schiller, Shakespeare, they were writing about this hundreds of years ago, and they had a very unique insight into historical processes. And I think often today, uh, the problem is that a lot of what Shakespeare wrote or Schiller or a lot of these great uh, dramatists, things are sort of reduced to these melodramas, these sort of power struggles, these Nietzschean power struggles. But I think a lot of, given the kind of modernist Uh, tendencies and the populist tendencies, the influence of popular culture on the way uh, we think as a a society, a lot of that has sort of uh, mystified or obscured what I think are a lot of very poignant and uh, precise historical uh, insights by people like Schiller, Shakespeare. So we're going to look at that today. And uh, You've talked about this, right? We're, we're going to be discussing specifically Schiller's Ghost Seer, which was a novel uh, he wrote, but never finished, but which is, is one of the most provocative works, I think, in terms of drama, in terms of history, and in terms of understanding this question of uh, intelligence, right? It's specifically, in, in Schiller's case, it's the question of Venice and how Venice... Uh, unleashes all sorts of machinations, all sorts of intelligence operations to basically uh, reprogram people, I guess that's one way to put it, or to brainwash them or to, uh, you know, change their perception of the world such that if you can control or change how somebody perceives the world, you can control or change how they behave, right? Mm -hmm. And I think this is, I mean, This has always been happening. It's nothing new, but Shakespeare and Schiller uniquely, I think they offer some very unique insights into that. 
So yeah, we have a lot to talk about. We don't have any specific structure, but uh, as we discussed, I think maybe talking about Venice, giving us a bit of a uh, historical account of what this uh, thing called Venice, this so-called Republic was, how it worked. And uh, then we can talk about how people like Schiller and Shakespeare uh, treated these kind of questions. So yeah, what's the story with Venice and why is that uh, important for people to understand uh, today, especially as it, it pertains to intelligence matters, geopolitical matters, et cetera, which you're an expert in? <laughs> um, well, uh, Venice uh, pretty much, I mean, Venice in of itself is a, an island that is like surrounded by like swamp area, just to give people an idea of its um, geography. It's yeah, and uh, that actually became very important in terms of it being um, a geographically uh, strategic stronghold. But um, it basically started around 700 AD. Um, some of the Roman families basically um, migrated to this island during the collapse of the Roman Empire. And um, Venice sort of uh, became uh, one of the offshoots of um, certain um, schools of uh, and schools of economy um, and intelligence from the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. um, so Venice, because it was an island of like swamp area, it, it was very difficult to have a military uh, invasion of Venice. And um, so they were able to focus um, more on the mental aspect of warfare and they became really a, a central um, component of uh, intelli intelligence operations, uh, espionage, and um, they also became a, a financial uh, center of mm -hmm. Europe as well, which I mean, the two go hand in hand. And um, there was at one point um, a recognition of all of the um, counter operations that Venice was doing into these areas. I mean, like Italy at the time wasn't a, a country. So, you know, it was like uh, attacking cities uh, more so uh, like Florence and, um, you know, areas in France. And there was a recognition by around... Um, the 1500s where the League of Cambrai was organized by uh, several um, cities to uh, attack Venice and uh, basically dismantle it. And um, <laughs> just to, uh, as I think it's very exemplar of Venice's uh, very advanced, like a uh, high level of operation in uh, mental warfare, they were able to, um, at the very end, the League of Cambrai was very close to dismantling its recognized enemy, Venice. And um, they ended up uh, being turned against each other last moment and Venice survived. Um, and uh, Venice never kind of uh, looked back at that point, like they were, they were really a, a powerhouse at that point. And um, I wrote a paper on this. It's going to be, I think, too detailed for us to go through in, in this conversation, especially with our focus being more on Schiller's ghost here. But they had um, a big hand in um, creating the Protestant Catholic conflict. Mm -hmm. And um, they did play a direct role in um, creating the situation, the political stage for the 30 years war in uh, Germany that pitted Protestant against Catholic. And it was uh, one of the bloodiest wars in Europe uh, where 50%, half of the German population was lost in this period. It was uh, 1618 to 1648. And mm -hmm. um, so Schiller, um, this is very important for us to know because in Schiller's Gossier, um, it's situated in Venice, but it's a, a German prince that the whole story is revolved uh, around. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, you know, the story is, we're not given direct uh, facts of things. So like, we're not given full names, we're not even given like the exact date, because it's, it's uh, narrated by the, uh, the viewpoint of Count O, um, who is a friend of the, the prince and kind of an observer to what we will see to be a very crazy uh, kind of rabbit hole 
that mm -hmm. uh, Canto and the Prince are, are find, find themselves in during their stay in Venice. Um, so that's about 50 years after the Thirty Years' War. So the Protestant Catholic fight is um, still going. It's a uh, it's it's still a very important uh, geopolitical tool, and uh, we need to keep that in uh, the back of our minds when when we're uh, reviewing the story. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, there, there there are so many uh, compelling uh, passages. Uh, and, and quotes and things in this uh, Schiller's Ghost Seer, which I recommend uh, everybody to read. Uh, it's not only just very well written and very compelling work, but the level of insight as at the level of ideas and the, the way ideas work, the way ideas can be manipulated, the way there, there is such thing as an, uh, how an ideolo what an ideological war looks like, right? What cultural warfare looks like and how something like Venice did this historically that it basically built a whole empire off of intelligence and cultural mm -hmm. warfare and finance, of course, uh, which often go together. Um, I mean, there's a quote just to, just to start it off. I, I think it's pretty much the first, uh, I have this quote in front of me. It's, it's the opening. And I, I think we can just throw this in here. So the speaker, at the beginning of the ghost here says, I'm about to relate an adventure, which to many will appear incredible, but of which I was in great part an eyewitness. The few who are acquainted with a certain political event will, if indeed these pages should happen to find them alive, receive a welcome solution thereof. And even to the rest of my readers, it will be perhaps important as a contribution to the history of the deception and aberrations of the human intellect. The boldness of the schemes which malice is able to contemplate and to carry out must excite astonishment, as must also the means of which it can avail itself to accomplish its aims. Clear, unvarnished truth shall guide my pen, for these pages come before the public. For when these pages come before the public, I shall be no more, and shall therefore never learn their fate. So this is how the ghost seer starts. And I think what's, what really pops out is when he says the boldness of the schemes which malice is able to contemplate and to carry out must excite astonishment as must, as must also the means of which it can avail itself to accomplish its aims. So, I mean, just to make a, a broad point here, I mean, if, you know, there, there's a lot of talk about conspiracies today, right? There's a lot of, you know, reg wanting to regulate which conspiracies are okay, which ones are not. Um, I mean, p there's this whole idea that somebody can be a conspiracy theorist or not. But as we see more and more as the discussion uh, evolves, it's becoming more a question of which conspiracies are true and which conspiracies are false. As even... Um, I was having a discussion with another one of our guests, Adam Cedia, who's a lawyer uh, in Indiana. And uh, he just made the point about this whole question of conspiracies, that conspiracy is a crime and it's actually prosecuted uh, relatively regularly. You know, so, I mean, this thing exists. People do conspire. And so I think it's interesting when we look at how Shakespeare or Schiller treat these questions of conspiracies, whether it's in something like the ghost seer or Shakespeare's Othello, or in Hamlet, or in Macbeth. I mean, they're not just writing that, and I think this is the problem with popular culture today. It, they're not, Shakespeare and Schiller weren't just writing that way because they think it's entertaining, mm -hmm. right? which is, I think, what a lot of people, the way they see even some of these more compelling works of art, um, they're actually, they're offering insights into how things in the real world actually work, and they're drawing on that tension, those paradoxes, and these kind of historical dynamics, and they're using that to present something compelling, uh, which forces the mind to think in new ways, and to make discoveries. So, yeah, I think, you know, there's, there's a bunch of conspiracies right here in the ghosts here, in, in, and in most of Shakespeare's plays. And I'd argue that it's, they're actually being presented to give the audience insight into 
understanding history, into understanding politics, uh, in, and into ultimately understanding the way the human mind works. Mm -hmm. And also insight into evil as, um, you know, yes. because uh, the, the translation you used is slightly different from the translation I have. And mm -hmm. in the first paragraph, um, uh, the translation I have uh, says, um, one will be astounded at the boldness of the ends which evil is capable of designing and pursuing. Uh, and I think yours had um, malice. And I mean, they're, they're, they're both of the, the same, you know, category, but, but evil is more like, you know, the, a source, you know, kind of concept. And that's the thing is that the average person is a good person. Um, you know, the average person does not spend most of their time thinking about how to um, develop a, a plan that is ultimately going to be at the disadvantage uh, to the majority. <laughs> but yeah, or how to deconstruct somebody's personality. I mean, most people are not <laughs> thinking in those terms. Yeah, um, but I mean, they're, uh, I mean, it's not so black and white that the, you know, an evil person is just like wholly evil, but, but there are evil intentions, let's put it that way. And mm -hmm. um, there are evil, um, constructs uh that are put into society mm. um and you know you can say an example of that are are things with the intention to deprive uh individuals of freedom for instance and mm -hmm. rather to encourage forms of um enslavement or imprisonment um to uh, take away from uh an individual or a society as well um, ability to uh, have choices for the to the future that that they can dictate for the general welfare versus mm -hmm. for the welfare of a select group. Um, that's sort of the evil that you know Schiller is referencing in particular uh, in the Ghost Seer, and the the fact that most people don't have insight into that, and they when they're confronted with it it is such an alien thing to them that uh, mm -hmm. they have no way of um, really understanding or relating to it. And, and what they tend to do as a, an instinctive reaction to that is to shut it out, to dismiss it um, as, as something, you know, uh, imaginary. Right. Or supernatural, or supernatural in the sense that Schiller's making the point in this one, uh, specifically supernatural. Right. And I mean, I think this exact this question of conspiracy, uh, the way you're describing it as well, and, and, and the nature of evil. And, and you may, I mean, this is this is a very important point that most people are good people. And I mean, when you're dealing with really evil intentions, it's hard to conceive of, you mm -hmm. know, because they're, they're, you have to go to, you know, some of these things require going to such great lengths, as we see in Schiller's Ghosts here, that it's just beyond most people that something like that is actually happening or, you know, really, you know, it becomes hard to imagine, you know, what, at what scale are things like this happening? And yeah. So, what is the purpose? Why, why would they go through such lengths of bizarreness? <laughs> right. Right. Bizarreness is definitely a, a chief quality of these things. Uh, and also though, ultimately this question of conspiracy, it's like, why do people freak out about the idea of conspiracies? Ultimately, conspiracies, the idea of a conspiracy is pretty much saying that the way the world looks and the way it actually works are two completely different things, that things are not at all what they appear to be. Mm -hmm. And that, that usually means what they appear to for most, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't really be controversial if most people believe things were the way a conspiracy is making things out to be. It's that things are being, uh, you know, it's suggested that things are actually radically different. And that's upset at, at a primal or human level. I mean, at, at its most fundamental sort of instinctual level, that's a very upsetting idea mm -hmm. because we all have an identity rooted in our understanding of how, of how we believe the world is working. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, how we believe the universe works, which we believe, you know, the world is either uh, working in a way that uh, 
reflects the way the universe works or doesn't, or maybe we think there is no such uh, order or natural law, as they call it, at which point things are pretty, you know, ultimately the world is pretty absurd. So you shouldn't really be surprised at whatever does happen. You know, there's an infinite spectrum of possibility. Humans are infinitely complex and, you know, everything just, it just is, right? But yeah, the idea of conspiracy, the reason it's upsetting and that, you know, we're not here again, this isn't a political podcast. We're not here to promote conspiracy theories, <laughs> but to recognize that, you know, when you're looking at these great works like Schiller, Shakespeare, and all these, these wild conspiracies that are being presented, they are, I would contend, they're not just offering this for entertainment. And being in the positions that they were in, uh, you know, they had a certain uh, insight and familiarity with workings of things at the level of courts, of kings, of princes, which is arguably, which is admittedly very different than how probably, you know, the quote unquote average person uh, goes about their day. So yeah, I, I, we, we want to unpack this. We want to look at some of these master tragedians, how they treat, how they present uh, the, you know, their own conspiracies and what we can maybe learn about that and, you know, how that's useful in terms of understanding uh, certain historical processes. Did you want me to uh, introduce people a little bit to the character of the prince? Uh, sure. And I, I have a, a, a quote here, which I think I can read and, and you, it, it'll, it'll work with however you, you choose to describe uh, the situation. Sure. Uh, so the quote here, as he was the third prince of his house, he had no likely prospect of succeeding to the sovereignty. His ambition had never been awakened. His passions had taken another direction. Contented to find himself independent of the will of others, he never enforced his own as a law. His utmost wishes did not soar beyond the peaceful quietude of a private life, free from care. He read much, but without discrimination. As his education had been neglected, and as he had early entered the career of arms, his understanding had never been fully matured. Hence the knowledge he afterwards acquired served but to increase the chaos of his ideas because it was built on an unstable foundation. He was a Protestant, as all his family had been, by birth, but not by investigation, which he had never attempted, although at one period of his life, he had been an enthusiast in its cause. He had never, so far as came to my knowledge, been a Freemason. <laughs> and then he just starts, one evening we were, so yeah, this is, this is the, one of the initial descriptions of yeah at the very beginning yeah yeah that's that's what i mean um schiller kind of uh puts everything that you need to know um about the prince in that that paragraph and um yeah i mean the the prince never had an identity of himself as ever being in line truly to be a king um and again germany wasn't one full country back then so he was going to be a king of like his region in Germany which you know we're not even told these kinds of uh, specifics but it's an important fact for us to always keep in the back of our mind um as to why you know the there's this ongoing weirdness around the prince what what kind of possible motive could it have mm -hmm. um but the prince himself never wanted that uh responsibility and as uh, Schiller makes the point of in that introduction that he liked to read a lot, but he didn't have a firm foundation in having, you know, a, a concrete understanding. Um, that's a, I think, a common phenomenon that we we encounter. Um, it's part of, of human nature, really. Like it's it's always going to be um, a thing that we struggle with when we're when we're first developing the foundation for our ideas. Our, mm -hmm. our structure of uh, thinking is how do, how do you know what you think you know? <laughs> um, or are you constantly in an open vessel for anything to be poured into? 
And um, so the, the prince, he liked ideas, but he didn't ultimately know how to generate him, them himself. And he also didn't know how to judge between those ideas. And he ultimately had um, a, a weakness, you can say, for the secret sciences in the supernatural. So mm -hmm. it's a, that's a common thing, actually, with even like academics who consider themselves in the field of science. You'll actually find a lot of them tend to have this uh, belief ultimately in mysticism and the supernatural when they don't have a logical explanation for something. There, there will be like a, a massive skip of skipping of steps in how one is formulating their their ideas. So you can be like super rigorous and a supposedly fact-based, right, in a logical, deductive, inductive thinking. Um, and then all of a sudden, when you encounter something that you can't explain with that methodology, which is in fact an extremely limited uh, method of investigation, they will often skip to the sacred secret sciences where all of a sudden now you're in a, the realm of anything, almost anything goes. And um, that's something to really keep in mind about the prince as we go further into this story. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think part of this whole uh, question of conspiracies as well is that, and I mean, we, we mentioned the nature of evil, but historically, one of the ways that uh, this kind of ideological warfare is done is, I mean, they flood the field, right? There's truth, there's half-truths, and then there's falsehoods. And I mean, the worst kind of, uh, or the, the more insidious and sophisticated kind of evil is not the one that's just going to promote outright lies. Well, I mean, that does happen, but... <laughs> it's half truths, right? You're if you really want to um, subvert somebody who s has some sort of uh, kind of intellect, has some sort of uh, power to hypothesize, mm -hmm. and uh, does ask questions, mm -hmm. you're gonna have to send them down uh, a rabbit hole, something that that that's gonna sort of take up a lot of their time, or it's at least going to acknowledge certain foundational ideas mm -hmm. but i mean i guess this i mean this isn't new the devil is in the details right it's by taking a truth and inserting some kind of insidious uh falsehood mm -hmm. or something that you can't prove and sort of just combining it uh you know then people hear this and they're like yes you know this like speaks to what i think mm -hmm. but they swallow it whole Mm -hmm. And that's where really the poison is. So I think, you know, if you look at the Roman Empire, right, they couldn't really crush Christianity uh, as such. They couldn't really just uh, destroy it. So what did they do? Well, this is the whole idea of all these cults, right? Of Yeah, sure, you can be a Christian. You can be anything you want. And then you just flood the field with every other kind of religion, every kind of uh, variation on you know spirit spirituality and you sort of just flood the field that way in order to dilute something and to ultimately just spread confusion right as you see with the protestant versus catholic fight right so it's trickier right and i think i, I this is one of the the things that people struggle with with questions of conspiracies it's like okay maybe some of it is true and maybe some of it is false but how do you actually get in there and you know separate the truth from the falsehood i mean i that that that's not that that's a pretty standard thing that's necessary for any kind of rigorous investigation mm -hmm. right of any idea uh, you have to be able to distinguish the falsehoods from the truth and this is what he points out this is what schiller points out in the prince that the guy didn't really uh, he read much but without discrimination and he didn't really have an ability to, to make distinctions because there weren't really any uh, clear distinctions in his mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I, if we look at the way education is organized today, uh, there's a lot of that, just throwing everything out, out there and, you know, saying, pick what you like. Yeah, I, um, 
And, and to uh, make the point as well that at this point, um, the prince, even though he's, he, he, he's a lover of ideas, he, he doesn't really know how to judge between them, but he's also um, described by his friend, the Count O, as a good guy. Um, he, he is um, a moral person and, um, you know, at the, the beginning, during their stay in Venice, the prince is incognito. So no one's supposed to know that he's the prince of so-and-so Germanic mm -hmm. province. And um, he's, he's very um, tempered um, because Venice is a bit of like a Las Vegas uh, city. Mm -hmm. And um, the prince doesn't really um, get into any of that at the beginning. He's very quiet. He's to himself. He, he reads um, at home or, you know, the residence that he's staying at. And the Count O has uh, some time um, free because uh, I think he's traveling through. And so he decides to stay with the prince for a little bit in, uh, in Venice. And, um, and then something weird happens to them. Mm -hmm. about and, the Armenian. Yeah, I think you could just go ahead and describe that. So um, Canto and uh, the prince are walking uh, one evening and uh, they sit at a, a bench and this stranger sits at a bench next to them and um, they're talking and uh, I believe how it goes is the Armenian uh, turns to them all of a sudden Right, because uh, the prince says, we have to go. It's uh, almost nine o'clock. And the, this Armenian says, he died at nine o'clock. And uh, they're very, uh, you know, weirded out by this person. And um, the prince finds out, um, I don't know if it's a few days later or uh, a few weeks later, that his cousin, who was next in line to become king of this Germanic province, died at nine o'clock that evening. Mm -hmm that the Armenian had uh, revealed this to them. And so at that point, the prince becomes obsessed with who is this uh, Armenian character. Right, and I, I found the passage, so I'll just read it because it's, I mean, I, mean, I, I think it's good to have a few, uh, there's, there's a lot of compelling stuff in the ghosts here. It, it says, one evening we were as usual walking by ourselves, well masked in the square of St. Mark. It was growing late and the crowd was dispersing when the prince observed a mask which followed us everywhere. This mask was an Armenian and walked alone. We quickened our steps and endeavored to baffle him by repeatedly altering our course. It was in vain. The mask was always close behind us. You've had no intrigue here, I hope, said the prince at last. The husbands of Venice are dangerous. I do not know a single lady in the place, was my answer. Let us sit down here and speak German, said he. I fancy we are mistaken for some other persons. We sat down upon a stone bench and expected the mass would have passed by. He came directly up to us and took his seat by the side of the prince. The latter took out his watch and rising at the same time addressed me thus in a loud voice in French. It is past nine, come. We forget that we are waited for at the Louvre. This speech he only invented in order to deceive the mask as to our route. Nine, repeated the latter in the same language. In a slow and expressive voice, congratulate yourself, my prince, calling him by his real name. He died at nine. In saying this, he rose and went away. So that's the encounter uh, with this. Uh, that's the first encounter with this uh, this sketchy, spooky Armenian figure. And uh, as it says, we looked at each other in amazement. Who is dead? Said the prince at length after a long silence. Let us follow him, replied I, and demand an explanation. We searched every corner of the place. The mask was nowhere to be found. We returned to our hotel disappointed. The prince spoke not a word to me the whole way. He walked apart by himself and appeared to be greatly agitated, which he afterwards confessed to me was the case. Having reached home, he began at length to speak. Is it not laughable, said he, that a madman should have the power thus to disturb a man's tranquility by these two or three words? We wished each other good night, and as soon as I was in my own apartment, I noted down in my pocketbook the day and the hour when this adventure happened. 
It was on a Thursday. So yeah, we could go on, but this is the first encounter. And, and the whole point is that it leaves the, uh, the prince, right? And again, so he knows that he's a prince. The Armenian somehow knows his identity, even though this uh, prince has been incognito the whole time. Mm -hmm. And there's just this quality of uh, perturbedness, right? That he's very perturbed. How, how is this possible? Um, it, this doesn't seem to add up. This doesn't make sense. So there's this initial feeling of uh, as you, weirdness, strangeness. How, how does this work? Yeah, and again, like this this person, it seems the cousin is living in the German province, and uh, the Armenian is is in Venice, and he knows, like at that very moment, is supposed to be the death of his cousin. So, like, how could anyone possibly be able to predict with such accuracy, you know, in the very moment uh, when someone's death is going to take them? So it, it doesn't seem, to, it seems to be beyond uh, logic, a logical deduction, induction, you know, way of, uh, of thinking. And so as we were discussing earlier, because the prince has this um, uh, tendency to go towards the supernatural, mm -hmm. he, he, he's, he, he very quickly associates the Armenian with, with uh, this higher purpose. And, um, you know, the, the prince does, um, as we, we see shortly um, later on, he secretly wants to be initiated into the secret sciences. He, he actually has more of an interest in this than the fact, the reality that he has, he has become closer to the throne. He's, he's basically, uh, you know, next in line at this point. Um, and the prince doesn't have a thought about that. He instead becomes completely obsessed with how the Armenian was able to like have such a power that he could predict such a thing. Right. And there's a lot of other, right. There are other things that the Armenian does to ultimately sort of uh, induce this kind of, uh, you know, mm -hmm. questioning of the supernatural and how is this possible? There's, there's a lot of things being set up and there's a lot of, uh, you know, traps being set which all the more makes it hard to believe. How could this all, right? That's the main thing. How could this all just be a setup? Like who, who would go to such lengths? Um, and I, I, I think that really gets to the question of the nature of the, the, the enemy or the, the, the person trying to, the, the nature of the agency trying to uh, subvert and win over political influence. And interestingly in Shakespeare, uh, with, with Macbeth, right? We have the witches, which are telling the guy, uh, which are telling Macbeth he's going to be king. Right. And once that gets into his head, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I'm going to be king. And he, why don't I just kill everybody and then I'll be <laughs> king and that makes them right. Um, you know, so they, they just put in this idea, are the witches real or did he imagine this? Mm -hmm. uh, who knows for sure? Regardless, he's, started to convince himself of all sorts of things and he starts starts acting those things out and so i mean at the other important event in the ghost seer that gets that wins that sort of starts to convince uh, the prince and sort of or, or throws him off kilter and he's no longer sure about anything that he believes uh, is the when they meet the magician, right? right the yes. and he sets up a séance because they're trying to. He wants to figure out who the Armenian is, right? And so he goes to the Sicilian. Oh no, he he no. It's um the way it goes is that uh, remember there was the this card game that the prince was uh was at, and right. he gets into a fight with a Venetian, and uh, the fight right. is so loud that the count in a, they're at a coffee house, the count, count O rushes into the room and he says, Prince. Um, and then everybody knows the identity of the Prince. Um, and this Venetian, apparently, you know, he has a reputation or whatever, I guess at these card games of like, um, assassin, not assassinating, but yeah, I mean like 
murdering uh, people that he has uh, issues with at these these card game <laughs> at these card games. And so half of the group leave immediately as soon as they find out that he's a prince because they don't have anything to do with this. And the rest of the group are fighting over who's going to protect the prince against this Venetian. And you know they walk. Uh, they, they're trying to rush home uh, from this coffee house and they get somehow, um, you know, forced uh, somewhat onto this like boat in the canal that takes them to this secret location. And they have um, basically these like dark robed people who present the Venetian um, like that he got. Huh? They're, like, they're like a Venetian sort of secret police, secret council. Yeah, yes. And uh, they present the Venetian that he got uh, in the argument with, and they said, um, "Is this the the person you know that you had the the problem with?" And uh, the prince is like, "Yes." And then they turn to the Venetian, "Is this the man you ha- were planning on murdering tonight?" And he said, "Yes." And then they lop off his head, and uh, the prince faints. And uh, the overseer of this turns to Canto and says, uh, "Next time you doubt the justice in Venice, you know, think again." And from that point on, the prince has got this kind of understood, unspoken protection in Venice. Mm-hmm. And um, he uh, d- he has this harangue of people that just start following him. He's like a little bit of a celebrity. And they are at a hotel one night and they're just drinking and uh, eating. And they get on the topic of the Armenian and the supernatural. And then this magician... Um, you know, brings up how he could possibly help the prince in this, but it's to um, to call back an old dead friend who died, I think, in a war, um, and so they're going to call this ghost um, to the prince. And the prince again, like he he makes a remark to the to the magician of um, you know wanting to be initiated into the into the sacred sciences. That's uh, that's when we we hear like how badly he has it that he he really wants in on this like how to do uh magic right and i mean this question of because you know we're talking about the 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 supernatural and whatnot and how in this case with this particular person that's he's sort of there's a mystery, there's the unknown there. And I mean, it's just known by, you know, this is human nature that when you're sort of presented with something that is unknown, um, you're, you're sort of less inclined to just, um, you, you can be swayed, you can be persuaded to sort of break profile, break out of your typical profile, because now you're, you're curious. And so you're willing to do things to sort of find out and, uh, get closure and you're willing to basically act out of character, right? You know, the, I, this is, you know, seduction or uh, manipulation. Like that's a lot of what it has to do with. Mm-hmm. But I think it's important to point out, and I was listening to a, a pre- presentation by Jordan Peterson, who uh, made some, some pretty compelling points about the nature of religion and spirituality and, you know, I think there's people who just say, well, religion, spirituality, it's stupid, or it makes no sense. Uh, and, you know, human beings are just, we're, you know, it's been around for so long because human beings are still uh, maturing. They still, you know, believe in all sorts of uh, fables and fairy tales and, and whatever, and religion's just part of that. But Peterson makes the point that actually the, the existence of religion, and it, it's sort of Uh, existence on such a mass scale over such long periods of times is more an indication of something, an innate desire, right? An innate need within human beings, which goes beyond any sort of just utilitarian purpose or sort of rational purpose that people want a sense of meaning. Mm -hmm. Having a sense of meaning in life is not something optional. It's not something that's just nice. Most people have no meaning some people find their meaning or i mean if you're in a huxley and sort of brave new world well you know meaning is sort of uh, decided based on your you know your your particular breeding and genetic uh your heredity uh so there's the zetas epsilons betas (laughs) and you know the idea of happiness and freedom uh is couched you know huxley uh, a lot of liberal minded people today people who you know, love the idea of freedom and, uh, 
ideas and truth are drawn to people like Huxley because he talks about happiness and freedom. He's a very good writer, but I mean, his vision of happiness and freedom also involves a massive eugenics program where people have meaning, but meaning is largely defined by, you know, their breeding, their her hereditary qualities. So, you know, yeah, you're a happy epsilon, you know, your role is just to produce, you're a producer uh, and you, you're just happy in that. So it's how to make the slave. And also when that happiness has a few cracks in it, there's always Soma for you. Yeah, yeah there's drugs, there's sex, there's synthetic music. Um, so that's all there to sort of patch up uh, any holes. <laughs> but the whole idea is, yes, we want everybody to be happy, happy in, you know, whatever it is their, you know, talent or role in society is to whatever it is that they enjoy doing it but it's coming from an oligarchical standpoint uh, where they're really recognizing that, you know, unless you do something about this question of meaning and, 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 and purpose and the nature that human beings are naturally creative, that there's naturally certain drives and certain desires that unless we can sort of placate those or create the illusion that they're being met because you can't really have freedom and, and creativity on a mass scale. You can't really, control that if people are making all sorts of discoveries and all sorts of scientific breakthroughs and, you know, implementing all sorts of fundamental changes that, you know, get rid, you know, uh, yeah, that they believe that they can actually problem solve. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Then, and then you lose all power, but all that to say that, so this idea of meaning, uh, whether you're a quote unquote good guy or bad guy, whether you're an oligarch or whether you're just, you know, an average person going about, uh, you know, their day, it, it plays a fundamental role. And so we see here in the ghost seer that the Venetian intelligence operative is, which is what he really is. He's not just a random guy. He's part of a whole intelligence apparatus. Uh, they home in on that and they see that's how he can be manipulated and I think some people are going to hear that and we, well, that's stupid. You know, I'm, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. I think religion is stupid. It's caused all these wars and et cetera, et cetera. But that's not really the point, right? Because that's, that's, that's what you think. So they won't approach you the same way that they're going to approach the prince. The point is subverting people by profiling them exactly. and then creating the kind of environment uh, whether it's something local, whether it's a, it's a more cultural or societal thing, creating the environment in which you can sort of manipulate that based mm -hmm. on the fact that regardless of what you believe, you do need a sense of purpose and of meaning. And right. So and anyone who doesn't have a rigorous investigation into something, which, you know, you really taken the time to to think something through thoroughly. It's not to say you'll have all the answers. But um, you have a method of questioning. Let's put it that way. Because, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times information is presented um, and it's often presented in a way to overwhelm someone and they can't navigate through that. They can't even form questions to challenge um, it and see how it responds with its answers to those questions, which is often like how you can start to see cracks in um, the validity or uh, the fallacy of uh, something that's being offered to you. Um, so, I mean, and, and the other thing too, is that like people, people are, are ultimately um, good. And um, if you don't understand that there's, there's like a, a, a natural uh, purpose that we have that is organized in cooperation and in good, because we're taught nowadays that those things don't really exist. Mm -hmm. um, it actually makes you a better slave. <laughs> and um, as uh, you were bringing up, Dave, um, that they honed in on the prince, um, later on, like in the book two section of uh, The Ghost Seer, Schiller brings up that, you know, the prince, he was brought up in a, uh, a heavily orthodox Protestant environment it was uh, very suffocating 
to a young mind for, you know, its imagination, its creativity, uh, freedom. And for the, the prince uh, tried to escape from that. And that's where he developed a more like kind of um, a drawing towards mysticism and the supernatural because it, it seemed like a, a, a freeing. So it seemed to still be addressing these bigger questions, mm -hmm. but without that kind of suffocating um, way of uh, like having these rigid answers, but that the answers were actually more open and more, more free. But because he escaped his former world of orthodox uh, Protestant Protestantism, um, uh, as like uh, Schiller describes, as like with his chains still on. So he fleed <laughs> with his chains still on. And mm -hmm. if any villain were to then discover what those chains were, they would be able to manipulate him because the prince was never able to replace the orthodox Protestant Protestantism with his own chosen acknowledgement of what a purpose is. Yeah, I have the perfect quote here, for, for, which is exactly what you're referring to. Maybe we should just read that for, for our listeners. Mm -hmm. So it says here, it's, let's see how long we want to go. Okay. To stifle all the sprightliness of the boy by a gloomy restraint of his mental faculties was the only method of securing to themselves the highest approbation of his royal parents. So his mentors who were assigned by his parents, you know, they were tasked with sort of, they had to, uh, as they say, uh, to stifle all the sprightliness of the boy by a gloomy restraint of his mental faculties was the only method of securing to themselves the highest approbation of his royal parents. Right, because he does like ideas. He is a curious person. Mm -hmm. The whole of our prince's childhood wore a dark and gloomy aspect. Mirth was banished even from his amusements. All his ideas of religion were accompanied by some frightful image, and the representations of terror and severity were those which first took hold of his lively imagination, and which the longest retained their empire over it. His god was an object of terror, a being whose occupation is to chastise, and the adoration he paid him was either slavish fear or a blind submission which stifled all his energies. In all his youthful propensities, which a vigorous growth and a fine constitution naturally excited to break out of with the greater violence, religion stood in his way. It opposed everything upon which his young heart was bent. He learned to consider it not as a friend, but as the scourge of his passions, so that a silent indignation was gradually kindled against it in his heart, which together with a bigoted faith and a blind fear produced an incongruous mixture of feelings and an abhorrence of a ruler before whom he trembled. It is no wonder, therefore, that he took the first opportunity of escaping from so galling a yoke, but he fled from it as a bond slave who, escaping from his rigorous master, drags along with him a sense of his servitude, even in the midst of freedom. For as he did not renounce the faith of his earlier years from a deliberate conviction and did not wait till the maturity and improvement of his reasoning had weaned him from it, but escape from it like a fugitive upon whose person the rights of his master are still in force. So was he obliged, even after his widest separation, to return to it at last. He had escaped with his chain, and for that reason must necessarily become the prey of anyone who should discover it, and know how to make use of the discovery. That such a one presented himself, the sequel of this history will prove. Most likely, the reader has already surmised it. Mm -hmm. One more, he says, he adds, the confessions of this, so this is after the, the um, they're referencing here, we just talked about the seance and how- oh, wait, maybe we don't uh, wanna, cause I, I want, well, did we okay. wanna go we'll over that it. a little bit instead of skipping over it maybe? We did or didn't want to? Oh, to go over it a little bit because that's a, an important, part of like what um causes the prince to basically break down or why don't we leave that as a mystery for people and just say that there was such an event and there was something that oh not to reference the sound specifically but to reference how the prince's thinking um changed from okay. that point on because that's what uh, affected his morality as well mm -hmm. 
um, because, uh, well, like right before the seance, when uh, the prince is still like obsessed with the Armenians um, ability um, to have these uh, awesome acts, he says, no mortal has yet learned what he actually is. Did you see how the Sicilian, that's the magician, crumpled when he screamed the words into his ear, you shall never summon spirits again. So mm. the Armenian was uh, in disguise as a Russian in their group during the seance. Right. There's more behind it. And the prince says, no one can convince me that someone can be so terrified of something human. So he's saying the magician was so terrified of the Armenian. So again, this, there's, there's something going on with the prince's thinking that he associates something um, with such power as being something beyond human. And so by doing that, he is unable to identify that there is actually a very human plot that is um, formulating itself around him. When the seance, you know, happens, um, it's such a mystery because, uh, and we won't go into the details of it, but uh, the prince really believes that he sees the ghost of his dead friend and it, it apparently looks a lot like his dead friend. And, and then, you know, there's this commotion and uh, the Venetian police come in and, and that's when we realize that the Russian in their group is actually the Armenian. And then the next day, uh, Count O, the prince, uh, they visit the magician to ask him um, why he, he did all of this. And um, the Sicilian, so basically at this point, the prince is like extremely disturbed because he's such a believer in the supernatural. And now the seance has been proven to be um, a fraud. The magician is a right. con artist, right? And yeah, the sacred sciences, like they're sacred to the prince. Like that's really what he replaced his, his religious beliefs with was in the sacred sciences, but still with this like idea of a, a moral uh, creative order to things. And right. when the sounds was revealed as this like disgusting lowly con, the prince, um, the purpose was never revealed to the prince and the prince just leaves that in absolute disgust with uh, the whole thing. And he, he tries to reason like everything that's happened to them up until this point, because um, it's, it's definitely um, weird enough to uh, for a moment, the prince suspects that there is a plot forming against him, but then he quickly waves it off and he um, instead says, um, you know, there's a quote, actually, he says, um, because he, he comes up with all of these lines of like explanations of uh, how all of these things could have happened without magic. Right. And he said, but I grant you that my conjecture is fabricated. I admit I am not satisfied with it myself. I do not even insist upon its veracity because I do not think it worth the trouble to make use of a fabricated and circumspect scheme where mere accident suffices. And so the prince replaces his belief in the supernatural with random chance. Mm -hmm. And But because he's replaced random chance now with the belief in supernatural, he goes down this... Um, you know, his, his ideological and philosophical underpinnings become not tied to anything moral. And at, at, at a, you know, at a certain point, he, he doesn't really believe in uh, truth or good, but that there's this like, just, you know, kind of alien universe that we live in that has, that has its own will upon us, but we can, our minds can never come to know anything. And the ultimate point to that is that the prince has given up on any kind of understanding and of any kind of situation of, him, of himself um, in a purposeful direction. And once he's done that, he is completely prey to the operation that is before him. Right, and I have, I have the passage right here, which I really think is, is worth reading, which is sort of encap encapsulates exactly what you're saying. And I mean, it, it's worth just, uh, you know, kind of recognizing Schiller is able to write with such beauty and to be so compelling, but he's also inserting insights of the, the highest level into the nature of 
uh, the human mind and our, our creative faculties and insight into uh, strategic questions, intelligence matters. And so, I mean, I think this is relatively foreign uh, in pop culture where things are just presented and again, in this sort of kind of uh, grandiose or melodramatic uh, way. But I mean, a lot of the stuff that we see, especially when it comes to like MI6 thrillers, James Bond yeah. or all this stuff, it's ultimately, uh, it's, it's quite misleading. It's very misleading. I mean, uh, there's all sorts of things that could be said about that, but here's what Schiller says, which I think gets at a more uh, real sense of how intelligence uh, questions can be approached. He writes, the confessions of the Sicilian, which was the, uh, the, the, the magician, the confessions of the Sicilian left a deeper impression upon his mind than they ought, considering the circumstances. And a small victory which his reason had thence gained over this weak imposture remarkably increased his reliance upon his own powers. The facility with which he had been able to unravel this deception appeared to have surprised him. Truth and error were not so accurately distinguished from each other in his mind, but that he often mistook the arguments which were in favor of the one for those in favor of the other. Thence it arose that the same blow which destroyed his faith in wonders made the whole edifice of it totter. In this instant, he fell into the same error as an inexperienced man who has been deceived in love or friendship because he happened to make a bad choice and who denies the existence of these sensations because he takes the occasional exceptions for distinguishing features. The unmasking of a deception made even truth suspicious to him because he had unfortunately discovered truth by false reasoning. That's, I, that's pretty, um, that's pretty insightful. That's, uh, that's not your typical Hollywood profile of, you know, the protagonist, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, it, that quote goes on to say a skepticism blossoming in him from this point onward, which is the, the skeptic, you know, because science doesn't have to be a form of skepticism, skepticism, which, you know, is for another conversation, but this skepticism blossoming in him from this point onward had no mercy, even towards things most worthy of reverence. So he lost completely his ability to be in awe of anything good of like a, a larger, you know, scope. Yeah, I was about to read that quote too. So no, that's a perfect quote. Okay, great. We're, that means we're on the, the same uh, page. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, there's so much that could be said about this. I mean, if people read something like Schiller's Ghost Seer, and also, I mean, if they, with the, this kind of approach uh, that Schiller is taking, where he's making this quite transparent, right? This is a pretty sort of transparent profile. I mean, Edgar Allan Poe, has also done uh, similar things with a lot of his short stories where he's often taking the profiles of, you know, these psychopaths or I, I love the, uh, the cask of Amontillado where it's this a Venetian, again, this nobleman, uh, this oligarch. And he just, and it's all this question of revenge, right? How the oligarchs are always trying to get revenge on each other. And, and I think he's kind of painting a picture of the infighting among that sort of, you know, uh, aristocratic class and, and sort of the, the craziness around that. And he, he plays with all these ideas in all sorts of different ways. And so does Schiller and the ghosts here. And I mean, so does Shakespeare with all of his, with many of his dramas, his historical dramas, there are all sorts of profiles of these, uh, I mean, you can call them royalty or decision makers or uh, leaders in the court but it's ultimately politics. You know, we have the same thing today, even if it takes uh, a slightly different form. The question of profiles and axioms and understanding what's sort of guiding uh, the person's uh, reasoning and therefore their actions and behavior. I mean, I think this is the real subject, right? This is what Schiller's putting before us. And I think it's so important today when people are, are looking at something like Shakespeare, right, because as we were discussing 
uh, earlier today, uh, Cynthia, people often, what is the idea of truth that most people have? The, the, the first sort of approximation of truth, well, truth is our immediate sort of perception of things, our, our, our the sort of our familiar surroundings. So our neighborhood, our friends, our family, uh, our workplace, and our whole world, I mean, for most people, is sort of anchored in these sort of direct interactions with and, and these basic sort of pairwise interactions with things in our community. But there's the rub that, I mean, if you watch a great play by Shakespeare, right, the actions on the stage, what we're seeing, what we're being presented with as all these characters, uh, they're really just predicates. The, the action on the stage is really just a shadow of that which is happening off the stage. And that's what Shakespeare, Shakespeare is trying to make us conscious of what's actually guiding all this action, right? Where's the tragedy? Mm -hmm. The tragedy is not on the stage directly. It's on the stage of the imagination where we can see these people acting out their axioms. That's really what they're doing. And in that sense, it's like science, right? It's just like a thought experiment. They're acting out their axioms and Shakespeare's showing us what they lead to. Mm -hmm. well, as you said too, like uh, that Shakespeare is not a melodrama. And, um, you know, if you took Shakespeare um, in the most superficial way, you could, you could think of it as a melodrama. But um, as you were saying that it's not, the tragedy is not what is on the stage, so to speak. I mean, um, obviously there are tragic actions by the, the individual characters, but um, what is always organizing everything that these individual characters are finding themselves doing or not doing in um, the tragedy, it, there's always a, a backdrop to mm -hmm. what they're in. So, you know, like in the case of, of Hamlet, throughout the whole play of Hamlet, there is the Norwegian army that's on its way to Denmark that we should right. have in our minds. Um, or in Othello, we should have in our minds that, you know, this is in the context of Ven Venice. Like, what is Venice? Or go see her as well. What is Venice? Yeah, what is going on in Germany at the time? And so these are, they, these are the backdrop. They're not talked about directly. But it's what's organizing all of the actions of the characters that we're so engrossed in of, like, what will they do in the situation that they're in, which seems possibly small or local, but it's actually, on, it only exists because of this larger backdrop that's actually controlling everything that is trickling down to the individual action. Right. And this is a very upsetting, I think, notion uh, for a lot of people, understandably. But so to restate, we we're saying before, the first approximation of truth for people is just that. It's the local pairwise interaction of things in their environment and I mean, in Shakespeare, if we take a Hollywood sort of melodrama approach to Shakespeare, the story really just is, uh, you know, all the, the predicates, the, the descriptive story of, you know, what actually happens, the plot, and da da da. But the whole point of Shakespeare is that, no, that's actually all being shaped by something higher. And it's only if we become conscious of the axioms, right, the things actually shaping all the action that we're experiencing, that's, that's really the only way to understand the actions on the stage is by mm -hmm. understanding the actions off the stage. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that this is the way the world works too. I mean, people are, it's normal to sort of, our, our immediate sort of uh, experience and interaction uh, with the, at the local level, I mean, that's the most direct and immediate. But the point about something like Shakespeare is that really all these immediate things, right? Yeah, a lot of people want to change things on a local level. You know, there's grassroots and da, 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 and, and there's a place for that. But the point is that unless you understand the axioms that are actually shaping things, the things that are shaping things on our local level are actually of a completely different order. And unless you're able to act on those, that higher dynamic, which is actually shaping things top down, you won't be really, you won't really be able to change things at a local level because you're not actually acting on uh, the ideas, right? 
mm -hmm. the, the axioms that are, which are not things that you can touch, but the axioms which are actually shaping the assumptions of an, in, of an entire culture, of mm -hmm. an entire society, of an entire group. And unless you can intervene on that, you're not really going to change things in any fundamental way. You may, you know, you can create. You might not even know that you are ultimately a product of that. Right, because you're only acting on the prejudices and the biases uh, and, and what people believe, and you're trying to appeal to that. Mm -hmm. But what if what they believe is wrong? You know, how do you, how do you change that? And so, I mean, this is what's happening in Shakespeare, and this is what's happening in Schiller. It's really, we're thinking about thinking, right? We're, we're being challenged to understand the axioms, the ideas, which are immaterial, but which are yet shaping all the actions that we're, that we're able to experience immediately before us. Yeah, and it challenges us to think of uh, a, an all-encompassing all purpose. So it's not just the purpose of the individual, like for instance, vendetta in uh, Hamlet, but it's um, you know, a, a, a higher reaching purpose. So in the case of the prince, as uh, we already talked about, he was a he was a good person, and Count O ends uh, book one saying he could have been um, a good king if he hadn't mm -hmm. um, allowed himself to be drawn down this rabbit hole, um, where by the end of it he is completely deconstructed and has no morality at all, um, and so really this question of if you deny. Uh, a purpose, like a human purpose around you that can either be for the good or the bad. If you can't identify that purpose, you become a unwilling tool for someone else's purpose. Right. And we have to, you know, I be able to identify that. Otherwise, you are closer to a slave than a free person. You know, in the case of the, the, the prince, he's, he's not in control of anything that's happening to him at a certain point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, it's because he's ultimately, he's fallen into the trap. I, I, I think he's been profiled and people get profiled. And this is how, you know, the, the, since the time of Venice, I mean, this isn't new. This is a historical fact. I mean, the way to actually uh, in history, I mean, this idea of subversion of cultural warfare. I mean, this goes back to the time of, of ancient Greece and before, right? But it, it, to understand it, these are uh, intelligence uh, methods, right? Where in, in the case of ancient Greece, you have the sophists, right? You have all these smooth talkers <laughs> who are foreigners, right? And they're all coming into Athens and they're, they're trying to, you know, they're, they're making all these nice speeches and people are being wooed by that. But they're throwing in all sorts of crazy ideas, right? They're appealing to people's sensibilities, right? The they're art using... of self-advancement. <laughs> right. And they're using beauty, right? They're, they're, they're getting, they're sort of uh, kindling certain noble instincts within people, right? But then they're, they're then inserting axioms, false axioms, into that thinking, which because now people have sort of been roused, their attention, they're, they're, they're hearing something compelling, something interesting. They're sort of, uh, they become open to suggestions, right? They become open to some sort of exciting idea without necessarily being able to unpack that idea and fully, I, I, this is the Socratic idea, but this is the Shakespearean idea is to act out those axioms, right? What, what is, what are the Socratic dialogues? What are Plato's dialogues? We're basically taking an idea and then we're saying, well, let's see what the world actually looks like based on this idea. Let's act it out. Mm -hmm. And it's really the only way you can do it. Mm -hmm. You need to act it out. It could look good on paper, but unless you sort of bring it into the real world and say, well, what is a universe organized by this kind of idea? What does that actually look like? And people are surprised, right, in the dialogues often to find out that they're seemingly uh, fine, noble, or unoffensive ideas can actually lead to all sorts of crazy consequences. Yeah. And Shakespeare's doing exactly the same thing. 
mm-hmm. right? And, and there's just, there's so much richness, there's so much nuance, there's so much irony, there's so many layers uh, to really unpack. But the point is that we have to be able to do that. We have to be able to unpack a Shakespearean drama. Well, that's and, the basic uh, idea behind a citizen of a democracy. Right, exactly. And I mean, we're seeing kings on the stage and we're seeing peasants, or it may seem like it's very far away. I don't have a horse and buggy. I mean, I don't, I don't have these problems that I don't, you know, you know, there's a million different things that I can't relate to. But the point about the problems with the princes and, and the, the kings and the court, it's not, you know, most people are like, well, I'm not a prince. I'm not, I'm, I'm not in some kind of major decision-making uh, situation. But the whole point is that, no, unless you're able to deal with questions, paradoxes, and problems at that level, you know, that's ultimately what's shaping things on a global scale. It's whether people are able to conceive of impassioned ideas, of profound ideas, or not, and whether they're really too able to explore and appreciate the nuance of a poetical concept, for example. You know, in poetry, you're not just I'm happy or I'm sad or I'm angry. There's a million things in between, right? If, if, if they were just such direct and literal uh, ideas, you wouldn't really need poetry. You could just say it. Poetry is everything in between. It's, it's what it forces us to sort of investigate and discover for ourselves. And I, I mean- Ultimately language is going to be an imperfect tool for what our minds are able to to do as an internal dialogue right. um and you know even you see like with science i mean shakespeare also was um a wordsmith but uh, leibniz had to also create words to uh express what he was thinking as like these um thought experiments um these gestalts and um and so uh language is really important that we, we keep it rich, we keep it cultivated, but metaphor, you know, goes beyond what simple words can do even. And, and that's why poetry, as uh, Shelley uh, said, uh, poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the, the world because that's where the real uh, solutions are gonna come from is someone who's able to think metaphorically and not like pragmatically. Yeah, to think, on, uh, to think beyond yeah. the immediate sort of conditions of things, right? Exactly. I mean, quote unquote, think outside the box, but yes. I mean, we can, we can have more, uh, we can go further than just think outside the box because that can mean a million different things. But yeah, the poet is able to reach uh, a deeper insight into things. And ultimately, I mean, insight is not sight. It's not something sense perceptual. So I think this is very upsetting for a lot of people, but I mean, when we say insight, it's not something tangible. It exists. I mean, the word exists for a reason. I mean, that itself (laughs) is something worth contemplating. Like, wow, we had to come up for a word. Is it just because this thing is, is random or doesn't exist and it's just a word? No, we came up with the word because we're trying to refer to something specific and it's actually not sight it's insight. And I I think usually the idea of insight is you're able to see how things come to see beyond just the parts, Mm -hmm. right? You're able to see that in all a a, a series of parts, there is actually a whole, and we're actually discovering the whole in each one of these parts, right? That uh, what is the principle underlying something. So somebody who has insight into a political situation, let's say, or a historical situation, it's when all the parts come together, right? It's when it's not just this guy fighting with that guy and that person arguing over this and, you know, this thing blowing up and that thing setting on fire, but actually understanding what's driving, what's causing the events to unfold as they unfold. Mm-hmm. And you can't, you can't know that just by taking an event, you know, yeah. what caused event A? Well, yeah. event A was caused when, the, you know, event B happened. Well, what caused event B? Well, event B caused what? And I mean, sure, people will be like, well, that's how it is. Okay, well, not if you read The Ghost Seer, <laughs> not if you read uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet, mm-hmm. 
not if you read Othello. That's not at all how it happens. Uh, right. There's there's a reason. There's an intention. Yes, and if you don't it, identify the reason, um, like for you're, instance, what you were going over um, as all of these events happening, like we're overwhelmed. Uh, with the news right on a daily basis of so many things that are going on um but if you can't put that into uh, a larger context of of purpose you the best you can do is just react to it so you'll right. you'll never be able to intervene on it because you don't even know where it's going right. you have to be able to foresee what is the direction of the thing in order to intervene on it and uh counteract it yeah. And I mean, I, then people get really kind of, uh, you know, pessimistic and, uh, you know, all, uh, you know, uh, whatever will be, will be, sit up, sit up. like it just becomes, you know, a whole sound of music. Oh, well, I guess things are just, you know, there's a sort of um, abdication of, you know, uh, manning one's own sort of uh, mental faculties and powers of reason, not because of any sort of, uh, bad quality or intrinsically yeah intrinsically uh bad uh or negative thing but there's just confusion and i mean schiller is treating exactly that i mean i think everybody in you know probably you know senior high school level or something should be able to read something like schiller's ghost seer and understand be able to deal with the kinds of paradoxes that he's talking about that being able to investigate one's own sense of identity and see to how, what degree that really shapes our actions, you know, and, and then all these other discussions about morals and ethics. I mean, that kind of goes out the door, you know, everybody's preaching the Bible, but, uh, or, you know, some or the Quran or some different texts, some sacred texts. But what's interesting is that when you actually get into it, you see that everybody has, you know, a different interpretation. There, there seems to be endless different interpretations. And the point is not to say that that's all there is, is interpretations. That's not my point at all. But it's to say that depending on the person's sense of identity, you know, they're going to take a different message from it. And there has to be a more rigorous investigation of one's axioms at an axiomatic level. Right. That's what's shaping our identity, which is what's going to shape uh, at what level and how we interpret things, whether we interpret it very literally, right? Everything is just pure literal text and we just have to follow that, at which point you don't really need to think, right? Um, so we were created with, uh, you know, a brain that asks questions, but we're not really supposed to use it. I mean, that becomes like a radical orthodox outlook. And, you know, then you just have the other extreme, which just becomes, well, it's all interpretation. See, everybody has a different take. Mm -hmm. uh, and it just becomes like an ice cream bar where everybody just, you know, picks their, their desired yeah. flavor, which it's is not false, any better. Yeah, it's a false um, concept of freedom um, because it's yeah. actually not freedom. It's actually the most divisive thing you could do for people. And again, I mean, it's a, I think most people do recognize that, you know, divide and conquer is a, a real strategy and uh, you want to keep people divided um, so that they cannot um, identify what their their common interests are because that will upset the ruling class um, but this idea of like um, various truths or, or uh, like various perspectives or personal truths um, is very divisive and what you were bringing up in terms of identifying what is the root of something, because there, there are truths and untruths and you can go through an investigation of this by, as you were saying, going through a thought experiment, uh, act it out. I mean, this is, this is what a statesman should be doing when they're, I mean, this is what Solon of Athens did for Greece. Um, you have to be able to have a bit of foresight into what are the consequences of, of these sorts of things. And by looking at the axioms, it's actually the most unifying thing. And then all of a sudden, not only do you not have so many divisions within one religion like Christianity, and you can't pit Protestant versus Catholic because they actually have something very important that's in common right. with each other. Or in, or in Islam, right? Or in, in many religions, right? It, exactly, it exactly. Back. 
it's a very unifying concept. And, and that's, I think, you know, something that would be so powerful um, if people can have a unifying um, investigation uh, as to what is uh, the good. It's not, you realize it's actually not in conflict because as you said, there will be different expressions of things, different, um, you know, there's not one way to express. There's different nuanced uh, expressions of it based yeah, on- Yeah, but it's, and it's not antagonistic um, to the other. So there, there are things that, that are, um, you know, fallacies and it's a, it's a false, you know, mode, but other times it's, it's a, it's a, a, a unique expression um, that is shared with, a, it has a shared recognition of something higher. And so if we're able to unify on these things, this would be a real game changer in terms of the kind of intelligence operations that are constantly going on, which is meant to confuse and, and divide people. Right. What we're saying basically is it's an investigation of axioms. Let's all agree to investigate our axioms, right? Let's all do it together. And I mean, let's actually do like, maybe we should do like Socrates and Plato and we all get together and we, you know, we, we make it like a whole night and or drama, you know, and we sort of just explore what these ideas mean, what kind of universe uh, do different ideas represent, you know, what, what do these worlds look like when we act it out and we really take the time to uh, unfold it. And this is totally different than the approach in education today which is largely just nominalism, right? They're saying, well, this person said this, right? And they believe this. And this other person said this, and you know, they believe this. And they said that the other person was wrong because of this. And so we just get a definition, a sort of dis we, descriptive knowledge, right? A sort of just description of what the people were saying. But I mean, once you get into it, people, how many different people, different kinds of thinkers from fundamentally different schools of thought will use the word freedom or how many people will use the word justice or truth. Mm -hmm. And when you get into this kind of rote learning standard education system, you find out that we're not taking the time each time to sort of take a nuanced approach and really get at, well, what is their idea of freedom? Yeah. I mean, the amount of intellectuals that I see today that talk about Huxley as this yes, great exactly. you know, mm -hmm. vanguard of freedom and liberal ideas. I mean, the guy was a prolific writer. He said a lot of things about a lot of different subjects. So, but the point is that's not good enough for you to just, you need to take the context. You need to be able to find, uh, you know, this is the question of insight. Sure, he said happiness, but he's talking about a mass eugenics program, a mass system of uh, controlled breeding. He, he believed in that, that wasn't just, his brave new world. He would, he strongly believed in the idea of heredity. And I mean, again, even that word, people can interpret it in all sorts of ways, but one has to understand where Huxley's coming from, coming from, you know, he's the son of Thomas Huxley. His brother, Julian Huxley is the, you know, a uh, 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 super uh, intense promoter of eugenics and actually is the first director of UNESCO, who writes in the founding document of UNESCO that eugenics has to be, the goal has to be to make eugenics once again thinkable. So, I mean, and then we can talk about that, but that's where it gets interesting. You know, we're already at, we're already a few degrees more than just freedom at this point. You know, eugenics involves, freedom involves eugenics, it involves controlled breeding. How do you decide whose place is what in society such that they will be quote unquote, you know, happy. Everybody finds quote unquote happiness in, you know, serving in their lot in society. And happiness uh, it, means stability and stability means you can't have change. Right. No change. The creativity has to be controlled. It has to be just confined to a, a small grouping, which will be encouraged to be creative. We'll give them all sorts of freedoms, but it's happening under, uh, a controlled environment. So all that to say, what turns out what was stated as a sort of outlook for freedom and argument for freedom is really actually an oligarchical <laughs> outlook. Very different. Mm -hmm. And I mean, but you can listen to, you know, uh, you know, one after another, you know, ad ad admirer promoters of 
you know, liberal values and, you know, how do they miss uh, this, the devil in the details there. And this goes from every side, right? I mean, the whole point is there has to be a rigorous investigation of axioms and Schiller is able to make entire dramas, uh, Shakespeare, entire dramas acting out the different axioms and showing us what these things actually look like. So they're very much platonic. I mean, they're very much like platonic dialogues where we're investigating some idea and we're sort of uh, putting it through, uh, you know, uh, uh, we're, we're, do, we're creating a thought experiment and we're sort of acting that out. So there's endless knowledge, there's en endless wisdom in these kind of works. And I think this is what we really need to all as a society uh, take the time to really study because the stuff that we're getting today, um, you know, all these melodramas and all these, you know, action movies and all these spy movies. And, you know, uh, there's just so much, there are so many axioms there, right? There are so many uh, assumptions about the way the world works. And if people think it's not actually shaping the way our society views itself or thinks or the way our culture thinks and feels and therefore behaves, uh, I mean, they're wrong. Uh, cinema is a very powerful medium. You know, we don't have as much theater today. I mean, this is not uh, Aeschylus's ancient Greece, but if we look at uh, the cinema today, it has just as much power, if not more, uh, than the traditional uh, theater setting of the ancient Greeks or of Schiller or of Shakespeare. So the same kind of Shakespearean or Schillerian uh, level of thinking should really be brought into that world, I think. Mm -hmm. Then we'll really get some action, you know, we'll get some really interesting stuff. Not that there's not interesting stuff now, but I think as we're saying this question of intention and getting people to think on a higher level, uh, at the level of, of axiomatics, uh, this is rare in cinema today. I agree. <laughs> and in popular culture. I mean, um, I guess we, we still want people to read the ghosts here on their own. So I think we talked enough about that. Uh, I certainly did. Sorry if I, I talked too much. No, not but, at all. Um, I mean, do you have any, any other thoughts? Based no, on I, think, um, I think that's a, a good place to end the, the conversation. Okay. So yeah, we'll do that. And we'll definitely be having you back to talk about some more fun stuff in the future. So we look forward to that. We hope everybody enjoyed the podcast and we'll see everybody next week. All right, thank you thank for having me on, Dave. Thank you, Cynthia. Talk to you soon.